Hello. Hi. Hey. Okay. So do we need to introduce ourselves? Sure. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, I'm Nikki, uh, Nikki Roberts. And, um, yeah, I guess for the context of this conversation, um, I've been a life coach for, is it five years now? I think it's At five least. years. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's even longer. I don't know. Anyway. Mm-hmm. It's long enough that I've forgotten when I got qualified. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I do um, a word of the year every year. And I think that's all you really need to know at this point, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Who are you? Mm. I'm Jill Johns, and I am a voracious student of anything and everything Nikki Roberts has to say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's always good to start off with Sassy. I'm happy. Yes, with that. There you go. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about your word of the year, mm-hmm. and what what do you think you want your word of the year to be, or what do you what is your working hypothesis? My working word right now is pupil. Pupil. Okay. And what made you choose pupil? Hmm. So my 2017 year of the word was giant, where I wasn't afraid to step out and be big and clunky and loud, but kind and gentle and just allow things to happen without trying to squash myself down. Mm -hmm. And it was really impactful. Mm -hmm. And as I got toward the end of 2017, I was getting more and more in a mode of, you know what, I, I realized I don't know what I don't know. And I... Mm -hmm. have a tendency to spend my time being in the teacher role and kind of the smartest person in the room role. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm tired of that persona, that mask, and I wanted to put that one away. Um, And so I was trying on the idea of being a pupil where I identify gurus and learn from them. And then I also like the idea that the pupil – you know, what happens with the dilation of the pupil in the eye and, and how that can be basically a window into our mind, is what some say. Yeah, yeah. And I really like the idea of kind of opening to the world what's in my mind and showing that to people, but then also allowing myself to kind of sit in the back of the room and observe versus being out front. So it's kind of like the empty bowl concept in Buddhism. Mm. Is that what you're saying? Like that sort of willingness to show up, um, willingness to be taught, willingness to not know something. And I I had a a, a non-constructive, an unconstructive habit of being an observer. And when I think of the word observer, I have a lot of judgment included in that so I'm observing a person or a situation and then running it through my filter Um, and so I think what a pupil does is observe but I think there's a distinction between observing with a critical eye versus being Uh a pupil who observes with a with an absorption concept you know like learning things I really want to internalize things and learn things versus see things and and be critical okay Yeah. yeah so there's more of like a Active engagement versus a passive observation. Yes. Okay. And when you think about this word, what do you feel in your body? It, well, and I think that's the reason for this call is that intellectually it fits. Mm. But at the, you know, in my body, it's a little bit uncomfortable. So I don't know if that Hmm. discomfort is a good sign or if that discomfort is like we haven't found the right word yet. Okay, tell me a little bit more about uncomfortable. What what about it makes you uncomfortable? So... Being, it, it makes me feel a little bit restrained. I don't know if that makes hmm. sense or not. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of 
um, attention of like having to hold myself down or hold myself Mm -hmm. underwater or hold myself like in, I'm envisioning a pupil's desk where, you know, it's like a hard wooden pupil's desk with the little L that comes out the front where you put your arm and you write. Um, I'm feeling like I'm like being, when I think of the word pupil for me, the, 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 on discomfort, the tension is like, am I stuck in that chair mm. for the whole year? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, there, so, so, but what you do know, the information that you do know is that you want to be in the place of being the pupil. You want to be in the active role of yes. sort of, it, it sounds passive being an empty bowl, but it's not really. It's really an intention. It's setting that intention and then wanting to absorb what comes into your experience. Yes. By observation and by actually actively seeking out information. And I think if I would think of, you know, so maybe it's my tainting of how, you know, Montessori learning would be, Mm. I would learn something by trying it and playing with it and and be a pupil but actually have my body involved. And because Mm. I went through traditional schooling and traditional college where it was kind of you sat in the chair and the teacher instructed, that feeling of, of it not being an active thing is uncomfortable. So maybe it's just my, um, maybe it's just my baggage around what being a pupil actually looks like. Well, so so okay, I had something similar happen to me when I was working through my word of the year. My word of the year is pilgrim, as you okay. know. But when I started, I started with the sense of like I had this feeling of moving from one place to another, and so for for about a week. I sat with the word of adventure, adventurous, adventurer, you know, but it felt it felt clunky and it didn't really I wasn't like inspired because last year when I found Renegade it was like in, it was inspired. It was mm-hmm. like there was a lot of like mm. passion and energy and, and I could I could mm. feel it, you know, it had well, it's like I cried. Yeah, I cried when we found Giant, remember? Right, right. It was it's a it's a huge thing. And so I love I love the idea of the pupil. I think that we could find a word that would fit that um, intention that that inspires you more. Because I don't think mm. you should have to fight and and wrestle with your word. I mean, I think <laughs> I, I think you do in terms of like how you apply it in your life, right? You 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 choose giant or you choose pilgrim or you choose renegade, whatever it is. And then you come up against something and now you have to sort of wrestle and figure figure out how it works. But I don't think you should have to wrestle with it like right in the beginning. Okay. I think it should feel, and this is just my like perspective, but I think you should feel um, immediately inspired to it. And right. And like that it lifts you and it carries you forward on, on these things. Okay. So, um if we, if you, do you have like a dictionary dot com or something? Um, yeah. Like a thesaurus. Yeah, like a thesaurus. Let's look at what are the other words that you could use um, that would help inspire some of that. Okay. All right, so the main entry for pupil being the noun, which is the student version of it. And that was that was my other piece. It's like, am I, am I going too far by trying to find this word pupil that's both the eye of my soul and the student, you know? Mm-hmm. Ultimately, I'm really looking for that, that student, that, that open bowl, that the soul side, then I am the eye of my soul side. Okay. But it is inspiring to start. You know, I feel like right now I am stepping more and more into my authentic self. And yeah. so allowing people to see who I really am, who I know I am, and who my intimate circle knows that I am. Yeah. Um, but showing that and sharing that with people and not being afraid of it mm-hmm. was one of the reasons why I was really inspired by the word pupil. So yeah. um, there might be two angles to play with. Right. So, and then also the... Um, uh, I I kind of like doing divergent things as well because 
so sometimes it's like I, I find a word like pupil and then I end up choosing the word ophthalmologist. Like, <laughs> um, because, as you know, I think change happens on the level of identity. So if you can, if you can personify it in some way, mm. it helps you to like really um, anchor in. When my, when my word was trim tab, it was like this really abstract concept. But I had um, Buckminster Fuller as my personification. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so there was like this, there was this anchoring in somebody. Um, anyway, yeah. So, what do you see under pupil for a support? Um So, uh, synonyms are um, beginner, bookworm, catechumen, disciple, hmm. um, follower. Junior, learner, neophyte, novice, satellite scholar, schoolgirl, student, tenderfoot, undergraduate. I heard you sort of stop at disciple. Mm, I kind of like that. Yeah, what do you like about that? Um... I really like the imagery, like I'm just having like a mm-hmm. Christian example of disciple, like mm-hmm. 12 people sitting around on the rocks in their Birkenstocks talking to Jesus, you know, and like <laughs> learning from him and learning from each other and right. kind of more of a a student of the guru, much more so like sitting on the rocks in nature and talking versus sitting in the classroom behind the desk. Yeah. And how does that feel? That feels a lot better. Okay. So disciple, what do we know about the word disciple? Does it say there about what its origination is or anything like that? Let me look. Um, Well, this is, let me go to dictionary because now I'm in thesaurus and so now I'm getting synonyms for disciple uh, as well. Oh, um, and those might be useful to yeah, look at as well. I'm kind of looking you, at them. So okay. It's, um, well, adherent, apostle, attendant, booster, buff, bug, catechumen, cohort, convert, devotee, enthusiast, fan, fanatic, fiend, freak, groupie, hound, junkie, learner, nut, partisan, proselyte. Pupil, again, rooter, satellite, sectary, sectator, student, supporter, votary, witness, and zealot. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Does anything stand out there for you? Um, I like the zealot word, but okay. I like disciple better, I think. Okay. So let's mm-hmm. stay with with disciple for a while. Let me pull it up on dictionary dot com and see what it says. I, part of why I like it is that I know what I'm going through right now is a spiritual journey as well, mm-hmm. and there's much more. Um, so in the pupil, it feels more pedagogic, you know, like like right. facts and data where disciple feels more um, spiritual in nature. Yes. And that might just be my own, you know, personal background with the word. Well, as your word, so (laughs) it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. There's three, there's there's, um, multiple definitions. The first one being religion. The second one being a follower of Christ. The third being a um, disciple of Christ, but the fourth says a person who is a pupil or an adherent of the doctrines of another, a follower, like a disciple of Freud. Okay. That's the example. Um, I'm much so, more drawn to the concept of being a disciple of, um, you know, some of the the gurus that that you know I favor, rather than Freud. You mean? Rather than what? Um, so when you say that you're much more drawn in contrast like the to the Christianity side. Oh, yes, yes. Right. Okay. So when you think of, like, if you were to commit to disciple as your word, what do you feel in your body? 
I feel I feel better. Like I feel like it's um it's more like adult to adult where mm. people feels more like child to adult and that mm. relationship was more uncomfortable for me. Um so to me a disciple is is a grown person learning from another, you know, wiser person or someone who's got information. Mm -hmm. It feels more voluntary as far as, like, a pupil is like, here are facts, here are data, you must learn these facts and data and learn how to reuse them. A disciple is more like, here's this person leading by example and teaching things, and I can kind of pick and choose from those things, the things that suit me. Okay. So there's a little bit of discernment in it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so I asked you um, how it feels in your body, and you mm-hmm. were like, better, and <laughs> that's not really an answer. So, right. Yeah. Um, how does it feel in my body? It feels masculine. Okay. It feels... Uh, okay, so phys- physically it feels like I'm standing up. It feels like mm-hmm. I'm standing next to someone. Who are you standing next to? Another man. Okay. Um, And we're both, like, it's very Christianity-oriented vision, like, imagery, but it's like, it's like flowy robes. <laughs> So it sounds like you're having you're standing next to a holy person. Mhm. A holy man, is that right? Or a holy person? Yeah, the the man the man I'm standing next to is much less of a man and much more of a figure. Like it more like a I it's actually I'm seeing more like light in the shape like that's taken human form, but mm-hmm. it's not really like I can't see any like specific features. So almost like angelic? A little bit, yeah. Mm, that's cool. So and I'm, I'm mm. standing very close, like very, very close. And what does that feel like if you're standing so close to them? It feels inspired. It okay. feels like I feel calm and peaceful and I feel like I would you know it's like I'm looking up with um hope and optimism in my eyes like just kind of ready for more okay so if you hold that feeling for a moment and sort of let it infuse into you do you think that feeling is a feeling that would carry you through the year that you could conjure again. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Without the tension. Without the tension? What tension? The tension of the, the pupil word. Okay. So I, I need to just let go of pupil. All right. It's an interesting exercise to do that because it's the 20-whatever of January, so I've kind of tried to take that on as my identity. Mm. It's an interesting shift. Um, So it's almost like reframing it to say, okay, for the first 22, 25 days of the year, that was my identity, but it has shifted, and that's okay. Because it doesn't have to be a year to year. It's not a magical January to December thing, right? No, absolutely. Yeah. And and I think um in fact what I what I was just gonna say as well is that um I like to take my words with me. So it's not that I leave Renegade and Trim Tab behind. Mm. It's that they stay with me and are now another aspect of my personality, another aspect of my life. Yes. And so today when I was speaking to this woman who calls herself the Renegade nurse <laughs> It felt completely in alignment, and it was no surprise to me that she turned out to be someone who was perfectly the right person for me to speak to. Wow. It was like, 
it was just like alignment of course. <laughs> so, so which brings me to my next question. If, if disciple is this year's word, how do you integrate bring the giant with you into this identity mm. of being a disciple? That's a great question. So... Can I share with you what I see? Yes, that would be great. Because what I feel when I think about a disciple who has the giant word in him is the sort of like giant-sized heart, mm. just expansive love, um, uh, power, but in a in a really um, humble and um, way, humility. Mm. Mm-hmm. but really expansive and really generous. Um, just the big heartedness of being a giant in the world and um, being able to affect change, but in this way of being humble. Because when I think of a disciple, I think of someone who is um, wise and mm. they bring wisdom. You know, they're not just... They're not just followers. <laughs> right, right. You decide to be a disciple of someone. You're not just a, a random person wondering generality. You're sort of like there's there's a there's a discipline and and I'm sure discipline is in that if we were to like Yeah. It is well that that was a um in the dictionary side of it was, you know, dis and so I when I read that at first I kind of hiccuped. It's like, ooh, discipline like to me, that's got such a negative connotation, mm. right? Like, what, if I am a disciplinarian, if I am, like, that feels mean. Um, okay. And it's the opposite of how I want to be and who I want to be. Um, right. I don't want to be hard on people. I don't even want to be hard on myself. Mm. Um, I want to, more than anything, I want to be gentle with myself because I've spent enough time being hard on myself. Right. And I think that the guru that a disciple follows, the guru would be gentle with her or him. Mm-hmm. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> I've, heard of some, I've heard of some pretty yeah. gurus out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what's important is who you are. Well, and it goes back to my giant because I was really adamant that my giant was a gentle giant. Mm. He was just clunky and he just wasn't very, like, graceful. And kind of clomped around and made a lot of noise, but at the core, like it was a gentle giant. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see that gen- gentleness pulling forward into the disciple, and much less about the clomping around and making impact, but more about the like being in the space with and holding the space, and 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 not reacting and 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 ob- observing to internalize. Mhm. And so maybe how so the question was how does the giant infuse with the disciple? I think that I think um I think there will still be giant moments in this mm-hmm. year. Like I don't mm-hmm. think that just because I'm a disciple doesn't mean I move into inactivity. Mhm. I think it means that I continue forward with my giant activities, um, but but with disciple being, you know, kind of the preferred word is that that takes the the front seat of Mm. who are you learning from, what are you watching, what are you observing, you know, who are you who are you admiring, who are your gurus in this process as you continue to do giant work. Right. It it also feels to me like there's a when you described the giant in the very very beginning it was sort of like very big and there was a little bit of like an ogreness mm-hmm. to it, right? Mm-hmm. And now I feel like for me disciple there is a um there is fluid fluidity and um finesse and grace. Mm-hmm. And so I think that the role of disciple could be a way that your giantness finds grace and 
um, finesse. And when I by grace, I mean graceful. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like um, it's almost like the giant had to be kind of unleashed and like bleh, like expanded and and let let take whatever form, kind of like a blob, you know, like mm-hmm. blah, blah. And then now it's like taking that energy and pulling it back into like human form. So I'm like, yes. I'm human size. I'm, you know, I'm at a human, human level. I'm not this big giant blob, but I've still got that power, but I've got like that gentleness um, and uh, observant side intertwined. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah, I like it. Why? Why? Um, why was my giant a guy? And why? I was going to ask you the same thing. I was gonna, that was going to be my next question. I was going to be like, okay, so what's with the size? Like, I don't know. Because last masculine? year, my giant was very concretely this big, like leader hosen wearing blonde, clunky, like <laughs> like Disney caricature, like fee fi fo bum kind of looking thing. Uh huh. And now this year, I'm like long, wavy haired man with a beard and a robe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know, I know, I've got a lot of masculine energy, and I know that my feminine energy is not my dominant. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see in 2018 or 19 and beyond if my form shifts into something either androgynous or <laughs> feminine. Well, and I wonder also if it's not got something to do with the way that you value roles. Mm. Because I think um, in previous conversations we've spoken about, like, you definitely look, or you have in the past, you've looked at, you've, you've been in male industries, you've, you've, mm. you see yourself as working in male industries um, primarily up until a certain point. Dealing with men, a lot of your your conversation is around how you interact with men. Mm. Um, and I wonder if it's not something about, and this is just a question, I'm throwing it out there, is it because in your mind the valuable role is often played by the man? Mm. Yeah. How does that sit with you? Makes me sad. Um, but it makes sense. Um, well, I was going to deflect here, but it's, you know, so a lot of the role models that I have really been, that I've been leveraging most recently are predominantly women. Mm-hmm. Um but there, yeah, I would. It's been probably multiple decades of of uh, training. <laughs> I was gonna say brainwashing, but training <laughs> around the um, the male dominated side of my life, right? Right. So, and I don't. One and I don't see. I mean, I really. At a, at a identity for myself, like I, I'm not like a frou frou girl, you know. Right. I'm not like I'm not super feminine. I'm not, you know. I don't have. I've I've I personally know that I have a lot of masculine traits. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a little bit afraid of the femininity side. It's easier for me to play the more masculine role. Mm-hmm. Um. But it is an interesting shift that my man at least has a robe on, like a big long dress, right? <laughs> he's a man, but least, he's wearing a dress. I can at least see the clothing of the flowy, long, white robe. <laughs> but if we look at that as like two ends of the stick, right? On the one end of the stick, you have this strong identifying masculine energy. And then if the sadness is on that side, what is on the other end of that? Because if you're sad, you're believing something that isn't true. Right? Right. Hmm. 
Hmm. What is the sadness? Maybe try answering the question, what I want is. What I want is. I want is. You know, I would be lying if I said I wanted like a pure, fluid femininity. Because that mm-hmm. feels like taking the curve at 90 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, but what I could accept would be a more blended approach, you know, like like owning and learning probably more and more of the softness and, and femininity or, you know, feminine energy anyway. I don't think it has to be societal versions of femininity. Yeah, and I was going I was going to challenge you that with with that because when I think of Meryl Streep, I don't think of someone who is soft. I think right. of Meryl Streep as being a powerful woman. Um, when I think of like giant. like like her or not like her, but like Oprah. Yes. Compassionate, but you know, driven. You know, strong. I think yeah, strong and like um, she's not the epitome of femininity from social standards, right? Um, but she definitely takes up space as a woman. Mm-hmm. And I think that's more who I am. Right. And I don't think, I don't think it's such a, like, a big deal. I think it's just more of a case of, like, hmm, this is interesting for a, you know, for the last little while, I've seen these aspects or these words in the context of masculine energy. I wonder what it would look like to include feminine ideas around this. It doesn't mean mm-hmm. your visual of of yourself as a disciple needs to be now a girl. It just, I think, would be um, instructive and maybe... Um, I want to say, like, um, not enlightening, because that's kind of a little bit too... Maybe, like, opening. Yes. Even. Like, it, yes. Just, it just creates a fissure and a little yes. bit of space to incorporate that. You know, I mean, I because the person that I'm standing near is non-physical, yeah. you know, like, doesn't take a male or female form necessarily... It yeah. kind of matches, you know, so when I said, look, you know, look, I'm standing next to a man, it's actually that I was standing next to another person in a long, flowy white robe, yeah. gown, whatever, but it didn't right. have a face or any defining features. And I know that that person that I'm standing near is a combination of both and all. Right. Um, and so maybe, maybe there's an integration piece that's going to happen this year for mm-hmm. you around that. Yeah. Which is exciting because that's more that's more on that learning curve. It is. And being in the disciple mode and sort of So I I always like to think of like the if this is playing out this year, where are the where are some like big rocks where this is gonna show up? It was interesting. So when I was pupil I had written down a list of who my gurus were mm. and they were all people on a national level. You know, so it's like, so I was going to go see Krishna Das again this year, and I was going to go see Abraham Hicks, and we were going to go see Mickey Singer, and we're going to, like, kind of some of the, like, I'd almost say, like, of courses, you know? Like, yeah. these are yeah. people, and here's who I want to go be a guru of and meet and see or whatever. Um, the concept of disciple, though, brings it much more so into my neighborhood, right? Like, okay. so this is the person that I'm sitting on the chair with, you know, next yes. to, and we're having a chat. Yes. It's, um, it's the moments where, and it's almost like, instead of it being this punch list of these are the people that I'm going to go learn from this year, 
Mm-hmm. It's more of a, I wonder what the different moments in time are going to be where I'm going to have an opportunity to be being a disciple. Right. Like yesterday, I, if disciple had been my word yesterday um, at the march, there were a couple, quite a few, I'd say a handful of people that I, that my, I was standing next to and near and I was just kind of observing in awe mm-hmm. and watching and um, acknowledging and that feels much closer to discipleship than kind of the guru thing and I think that was the I think that was the distinction with people was like I'm in the chair and they're at the front of the room and it feels subordinate mm. where this feels more um, shoulder to shoulder mm. and I think also what I like about it is there's um the word disciple, I mean, obviously because I grew up with Christianity, so there's always this, in my mind, is there's always 12 of us. Yeah, <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> um, so there's a, like a, there's a communal thing. There's yeah. this um, group learning thing. There's yes. this, um, yeah. And I think um, there's a lot to be said to be to be looking at in the context of Christianity, not that you have to take it on, but that you can even sort of, I don't want to say, what is it what I'm trying to say? Um, what I'm finding for myself is that, I, that I'm that i not having so much of a need to push away the teachings of Christianity, but rather to be sitting side by side with those teachings. Mm. Um not so much of a of a um, student pupil dynamic as much as a here are these things that these disciples mm. learned and there's some there's some pretty interesting disciples and saints out there that are <laughs> um, instructive. And I like the concept, too, you know, so we're sticking with the, you know, there's 12 of us kind of thing. Um, yeah. One of the things I appreciate is that all 12 learn something different, and it's mm. kind of through what all 12 learn that it puts together to make a whole. Yeah. And there's a little bit of relief for me that comes in the concept that, like, I'm only really responsible for, like, a 12th of it. Okay. Yeah. And then, like, somebody else will pick up what I don't pick up. And, like, somebody else will pick up what they don't pick up. And and, and when I say pick up, I mean, like, you know, so if there's, if, there's, if there's a guru in front of me and there's a bunch of us observing that person, I'm only going to pick up a portion. But the yeah. other people around me are going to pick up more. And then sharing of stories among us yeah. will kind of help create the whole picture. So it... It not only requires me to be observing the guru, but it requires me to be collaborating with the other disciples. Mm. And and that's like a sweet spot for you. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love how that plays in. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about, you know, you you have different groups of people around you, so there's different themes. With this mm-hmm. as well, which is nice. It doesn't just have to be a spiritual theme. Yes. Um, it can be a, a business theme. It can be a, you know, it, it's it's multi-talented. <laughs> yeah. Well, and even like the the task for me of asking myself the question of who are the other disciples. Mm. And and um, it, that's another. And like, that's a huge question because my mind immediately goes to. So, with the twelve um, Christian disciples of Jesus, they they were such a varied group of people. Yeah, and there was even the one who like went went like off on his own and and sort of behaved out of sync with everybody else and. Um. And so it really opens you up to exploring connection with people who look very different 
mm-hmm. to you or come from very different backgrounds. You know, you don't have to go and sort of seek out all the people who believe in this right. one person. Right. <laughs> you know, you can, that can be broader. Or I suppose the connection point was that they believed in this one person. So I correct that. It's, it's, it's more of like, it's not, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to look the same as me or um, mm-hmm. approach life the same way I do, but we all follow this one person. Right. I think it has a lot of scope for you. I do too. And like, I really, it feels so fun. Fun is good. <laughs> yeah, fun is good. Um, there was something I wanted to ask you about it because, oh, that's right. So um, one of the things I like to do is kind of try and find people who represent how I want to show up. Mm. Um so, like, one person that I came across in my search was Lily Tomlin. She's, uh, mm-hmm. do you know who she is? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, she was, I don't know why, I think I sort of, I think I researched, like, adventurous woman or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I can't remember now. But Lily Tomlin was one of them. And then there was another one. She was an author, and I actually bought one of her books, which was very good. Um but it, when I when I do that, like, okay, so for me, when I think of this word and for you and the combination of giant and um, disciple, I think of um, Queen Latifah. Oh, yeah. Because she has a really strong spiritual component, but she also is someone who takes up space with her personality. And, mm-hmm. um, and I just think she's got such a huge heart. Mm. Um so finding a couple of people that are like personifying it and learning their stories, I find can be very helpful. Excuse me. I like that. Um, and then, you know, I do a lot of, uh, with my words, I do a lot of exercises with them. I play with them. I like research the breakdown of the word, where it came from, whether it was Greek or Italian or French and you know, what that was and when it came about. And it, maybe it's a little geeky of me, but um, what I, what I, I, I'll tell you why I do it. So in the beginning, when I first, like years and years ago, would choose my word, it was jumbled in with a lot of other stuff that I was doing. And by the middle of the year or sort of three months into the year, it kind of had fallen by the wayside and it wasn't in my conscious mind. Okay. Um, and I didn't, I didn't get to leverage the word as well as I could have. So now I try and keep it um, close to me in a lot of different ways. You know, like we get the bracelets made. Um, I might write some poetry or prose around it. What my like this year, I wrote um, several paragraphs about what I what I wanted this to do for me, um, in terms of how I wanted to show up this year. Um, and so I use I use the word in a lot of different ways. I've done paintings, and so what do you think about like how would, how do you want to keep it close to you? Um, so I like words, like the physical word itself. Um, I think I can make fun things on my cricket <laughs> with yeah. the actual word itself. Um, I, I do like the idea of Understanding its origin, but defining it for myself. Yeah. Like getting clear on, you know, what that actually means and looks like to me. I mean, I think exploring the concept of, you know, kind of having the 12 buddies that are all observing the same guru um, and then learning from them. I think that that, like, I almost like, I don't even want to put people because I think you're right. I think subject by subject, the 12 people will change. And I think the number will change from one to 
a hundred around, you know, doesn't, there's nothing magic yes. about the number 12. Right. But it's like, you know, maybe starting with the topics that I know that are my topics or my people or my gurus already and kind of identifying who the other disciples are with me and really starting to see that team. Mm. Um, and what comes up for me when I hear you say that is also how you take care of those people. Mm. Like how you are interconnected with them. Yeah, I really like that role. Mm. Like I like to be a peer leader, you know, like mm. not the mm. not the chief, but like a group of peers working on something, but I'd gravitate into the like leadership role. Right. And I think I'm assuming that, like, in the world of disciples, that there's probably that that happens, you know, like one of the 12 kind of steps up, you know? Yeah, I think so. And I think I think keeping it fluid mm -hmm. will also give you an opportunity. I, I found myself, especially in the last year, trying to find opportunities not to be the leader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, putting myself in like an accountability group where nobody knows me. Like they don't know me at all. They don't know my history. They don't know anything about me. And I and I actively don't share it with them. Mm -hmm. Right. Just being allowed to not lead. Um mm -hmm. and it's kind of there's a sense of relief and there's a um I think this is you know when when I was working specifically with strong women one of the things that stood out to me was there's a level of tiredness and exhaustion and burnout that happens for them because they're always pushing to the front. And it's not always um, – it sort of happens that way naturally because of who they are, but it also happens because it's habitual. Right. And they tire. <laughs> they want a moment where they don't have to do that. So I'm thinking if you have 12 people around you, that sometimes it it might be a good idea to let other people step forward and take on leadership roles when and give yourself a rest. Mm -hmm. You can do that in that role. Um, yeah. If you were staying fluid with it. For sure. How does that feel? Yeah, it feels good. Even when you think about not being the leader? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I I, think... Um, I think I'm settling more and more into a constructive leadership role, much more so than I ever have anyway. You know, it's like thinking about the build of the labyrinth. It was like... I, I know much more so that I am a better spark mm. versus sustaining leader. mm and I am doing a better job of discerning of, okay, this project, this initiative, this whatever, like I will, you know, I can serve it well by being the spark to it. Yeah. Um, but very quickly. Um, then I go from spark, if I can go from spark to leader to cheerleader pretty mm. quickly, like that's mm. the optimum formula for me. Okay. Yeah, that the leadership thing is interesting. I was just while you're talking, I was reminded of there's um there's there's perfect timing with that. And I think you knowing that you're sort of having a, a really well defined sense of when you should be the leader and when you should step away from that. Mm -hmm. Um it's hugely powerful. I just watched um some sort of a group of women implode really because the leader has been the leader for I don't know probably over a year now and she's she's a fantastic person she's lovely but um, she did not have a good sense of the timing of how long her leadership needed to be mm. there you know and so then the whole thing <laughs> imploded and now yeah. there's like separation right I think that's huge you knowing that yes 
And so, it's funny, it's funny mm-hmm. because um, I know that and I articulate it quite frequently. Like I mm-hmm. say to people, you know, I know myself well enough. I know that this is where my strength lies and I know this. And it's interesting because I get a little bit of pushback. Like, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. Like, that you don't want to like lead the project through and through or what do you mean like okay so mm. you're the spark that gets the women's march going and done but you don't like you don't want to be on any of the committees that come from the women's march or you don't want to do like the sustaining work or you don't want to do this and it's like no that's not my role right right yeah. um but because i take a lead and take the role of an event um there's a perception but it's like that's my like my ability to call myself on it and be clear and not step into a role or into a um obligation or into something is my way of not leading. Yeah. And I think it it plays nicely with the idea of a disciple and that you really know what your role is. Yes. I was watching um, the documentary uh, Walk With Me about uh, Thich Nhat Hanh the other night, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um, very little was actually any much footage of him, and it was a lot about his devotees and what they were doing every day, and the one thing that stood out to me was they were preparing his meal, and it was done with such mindfulness. Mm they had such clarity about their role. And they kind of joked about it. They said, yeah, sometimes it gets boring. You know, the newbies like to do this every day, but we're kind of, we've been here for a while and it's, it's a bit boring now. But they were very clear about their, what their role was. So mm-hmm. I, um, there's, um, there's a peacefulness about that. There is. There's a peacefulness and there's a, um, and I think, there's a maturity in it. Mm, yes. Uh, or I feel for myself, I'm not, you know, I don't know how anyone else feels, but I feel um, like I'm getting a grasp on my maturity by being able to understand myself and communicate it and not, um, you know, not make it into anything bigger than just stating the fact of, you know what, this is where my strength lies and this is how I add value to this group. Mm. And I I do, like what you just said there, like the Thich Nhat Hanh thing, like there's a huge component for me of um, leading by example. Mm. Like I don't want to teach people per se, but I want to do things, you know, and have like my actions speak for themselves versus having to justify or explain things. Um, and being... I think it's layered. It's like I have a guru and I'm a disciple, but for some I may be their guru and they may be my disciples. Yes. And there's a little piece of discomfort for me of like who the hell do I think I am that I have disciples, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But I think I have disciples around certain subjects only, and they're the subjects that, you know, and I think that would be true of all of us. Right, like yes. everybody I know is my teacher in some way, shape, or form, and I've I've shied away a little bit from the vanity side of like, well, who do I think I am if people want to follow me? Right. Um, but if you think about back to like the Christianity Christianity analogy, it wasn't Jesus that built what is happening in Christianity today. It was the disciples of the disciples of the disciples of the disciples. You know? Yeah. Right. So there's a little bit of the ripple effect as well of, like, I can simultaneously be a disciple and be a guru to other people. Yes. But I need to keep my eye on being the disciple and practicing new behaviors and not intentionally try to teach or lead other people. They will just lead by observation or they will follow by observation. Yes, I think um, one of the little clips in this movie was they interviewed one of his disciples and they asked her some, well, there was a man. They were actually videoing, videoing her answering a question of a man. And her answer was deeply profound. I mean, I was just like, her choice of words and 
the simplicity, you know, the, the Buddhist simplicity of being able mm-hmm. to say something deeply profound in like three words. Four words. Yeah. Yeah. I don't um, have that gift. No, me either. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what struck me was that um, no one had put the word guru on her back or on her forehead. And she didn't see herself that way. She saw herself as a disciple. And yet, this man who was, a, you know, several steps behind her in his path, saw her as being a valuable resource mm. and someone to look to, um, someone who could um, be the network between him and, um, say. So, and I think that's probably true of the original disciples with Jesus as well, is that they were the connection piece between him and the people. Right. So that's also an interesting, like, nuance that you could look at. Is like, how mm-hmm. are you, how are you the... How am I a connector? And that's, I love that piece. Mm. And the conduit. Mm-hmm. You know, if you think of, I, I don't know, I have these little visuals. They're probably from Bible story books, but like of the disciples being with the bread, uh, the bread and fishes, and you know, Jesus was there, but they were the ones carrying the baskets around and talking to the people, and they were the ones that were trying to keep people away from him, and they were the ones that were like, who is this person coming through the roof? You know what I mean? Right. Like, so um, they were at the front line. Um, which is sort of a really interesting um, angle to play with. So, how does this feel in your body? Yeah, so but perfect. <laughs> perfect. Perfect feels like what? Perfect feels easy, mm. but energizing, um, like exciting. Um, I wanna, I like I like I can't wait to um, like a little bit of like um, tension, you know, like nerve excited tension. So like the tension that I felt before was like weighty. This is like tension with like energy. Good. So it feels good. I'm excited too. I can't wait to see yeah. how this is going to play out. I know. I think, I think it's yeah. We got it. Awesome. Good. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Onward. Yes. All right. Well, I will talk to you later. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.